Well, welcome to our second Thursday noontime win um, webinar. I'm Alec Hogg. Uh, you're not going to see me today, but you're going to see our three guests, and I'll be introducing them to you in a moment. I'm delighted that we've managed to upscale our number of seats, so nobody will be turned away today, which is just as well, because the attendees are now going uh, very rapidly up to and beyond the 500 that we used to have. But let's just get the technicals fixed up. First, uh, my colleague and our managing editor, Stuart Lohman, is monitoring everything to make sure that the tech all goes well. Stu, do you want to just make absolutely sure that everyone can hear us and, uh, and tell them how the questions work? Excellent. Thanks, Alec. Uh, welcome all. Um, just quickly, if you can see three pretty faces and hear my voice clearly, there's a little high five a button on your control panel on the right hand side. If you give us a high five, we know we're coming through loud and clear. Lovely stuff, but lots of high fives there, Alec. It's always good. And we do like to keep them very conversational, as those who've been with us before know. There's little questions uh, drop down menu on the control panel on the right hand side. If you can please put your questions in there, Alec will pick them up, or myself, and we'll pass them on to the relevant uh, guests. So thanks, Alec. All good to go. Thank you, Stu, and welcome again to our three guests, Suzanne Stevens, Stafford Marcy, and Tony Manning. Uh, we're going to kick off with uh, the one I've known the longest, Tony. You and I go back, my goodness, many years. You're also one of those people who knocks me into shape every now and then when when I'm straying away from uh, proper business practice. Uh, it's It's been a privilege to know you over all of this time. What people don't know uh, is at the turn of democracy, you you wrote a book called World Class, which is still one of the, the for me, one of the great management books, uh, which said we had one single world class company at uh, the time that we went into democracy. And I'm not going to steal your thunder. Who was it? <laughs> well, it was SAB. Of course it is SAB. <laughs> for a minute, I thought, goodness, we haven't swapped notes. That could be embarrassing. <laughs> uh, as we see from the screen here that uh, you have also 13 books. I put your latest book there, The, the Critical Core, down at the bottom. Uh, what's that one about? Thank you. Um, Alec, the last two books, I had a look at the, I've been fascinated by management practices and how many tools managers use and how they use some well and some very badly. And so I spent a long time looking at what management tools were absolutely critical as opposed to arbitrary and you could use them or not use them according to your whim. And there were eight that came out of this process, which took many years, in fact. And uh, they, they're quite obvious, but they really are very powerful. And companies that don't make them happen are almost certain to underperform. Companies that do are almost certain to outperform the rest. Well, I hope uh, Mike Hankinson, uh, I think Tony would know you quite well. We certainly know each other well, uh, chairman of SPA and other major companies. Can you hear us now? Just give us a thumbs up because I see there was a question to, or in the question box uh, to say the volume is very low. Hopefully it's a, a lot better now. Um, and if it isn't, uh, let us know and we'll fix or address it. Yes, good, says Mike. Thank you. It was a little bit of user error here on my side. Suzanne Stevens, you don't know about user errors, though. You, you're right on top of things. We've been, again, we've been partners with BrightRock right from day one virtually at Biz News, and thanks for the support. I was just wondering whether we're going to have another Davos in uh, January. You've You've sponsored our divorce meetings or our, our attendance there for, for, what's it, six or seven years since we've been going. I'm just wondering if, if you think, given the, the, the changes through COVID-19, that divorce will even happen. Well, I suppose um, in the world that we're living now, Alec, um, January is a very, very long way away. Um, <laughs> I think so much of what we do at the moment is kind of working on weekly cycles and, and monthly cycles. So um, do, do I think that Davos would be a useful forum to debate, um, you know, the, the, the current global environment and, um, and, and particularly how, how we as, as the, you know, as a, as a collective um, human species react to some of the global challenges we now uh, now face. I think I think Davos would be um, a very powerful forum to take place. Um, but whether it actually happens or not, you know, <laughs> as I say, I think I think we live in a world now where where those time frames are are, are just um, it, it's not really even possible for us to speculate. 
Yeah. Uh, you started uh, Bright Rock a little bit earlier, a little bit before Biz News started, and that's why it's been lovely to watch your incredible progress over the time. Where did this love change idea come from? Because we certainly, if if that's your, uh, your, your reason for being, you certainly are in a sweet spot right now, because aren't we just changing? Yes, I think, um, well, 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 the love change positioning and the message comes really, it, it fundamentally starts with the way um, our life insurance product works. So um, one of the key things that we recognized um, um, when we started the business, which um, which started in, in 2011, um, was that, that current products in our category tend to be very static and that they don't enable the client to adjust the way their cover works over time. So as their lives change and their needs change and things shift in their lives, um, the only way they can really um, keep pace is by, you know, on, on traditional products is almost to kind of, uh, uh, you know, discard what they had and, and start from scratch every time. So, so the product itself is in, in, enables a journey and somebody to um, adapt their cover as, as their, their needs change. But then in the context of, um, you know, of our business um, and where we where we positioned in the market, we, we were very clear from the beginning that this idea of, of being able to um, embrace new thinking and new technology um, new approaches to 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 the way we do business um, is fundamental not only to the way our product works and how it works in people's individual lives, but actually very much in terms of of how we um, approach business as a, as a as a bigger as a bigger task. Stafford Marcy is a man who uh, has embraced change. Uh, we met oh, Stafford, it's I don't know, well over a decade ago when you were running Google South Africa. Then I asked you and you very kindly accepted to come on my board on uh, MoneyWeb when uh, that was still a public company that I was involved. Well, it was my company, I guess, at one point. And, and we've <laughs> come a long way together and always uh, uh, in the forefront of my mind is that you're a scientist, you're a computer scientist, although most people think that you're a marketing guy because you've got uh, such a good way with words. How are you enjoying the new world that we work? Because that's a heck of a challenge. I mean, it, it's not, you know, I love the place. We, we, we had we work in London and I, I just love our space here that you, uh, that we, we, from you in uh, 155 West Street. But uh, from your perspective, the changes can't have been easy. Well, it's, you know what, the, the privilege of being in the position that I am at WeWork is that we coagulate, you know, disparate species of businesses into, you know, towers and towers <laughs> and floors. And, and I have the opportunity to actually see what's happening to these businesses. Um, so, so forget the WeWork business for a second. Just, just having the ability to stand on a cliff and look out at, you know, very large businesses like Nasper's that are in our space, you know, banks that occupy the technology companies, et cetera, and actually observing and seeing on a week by week, day by day basis, what these organizations are going through as they metamorphosize themselves. I mean, there are incredible changes taking place where, you know, what we're seeing, which is quite surprising to us, is so many blue chip large enterprise companies now picking up the phone and actually speaking to us that would never have spoken to us before. Simply because working from home was never an option to them. You know, the, the folks thought that's an impossibility my business simply cannot operate with people sitting at home. And suddenly they've realized that that is possible. They've put the necessary ICT infrastructure to make that possible. And, but they realize that it's not sustainable in the long run. You know, working from home is great in the beginning. It breaks the mold, but it forces you to kind of reimagine your organizational structure. And what we're seeing is people are thinking that the middle of that pendulum is, you know, there's this corporate, I'm in a building and then on the other side is I'm totally completely working from home and I think in the middle is can I access a space that's not arcane from a, a connectivity perspective that is professional but gives you all the benefits of not from a proximity perspective and I think what I am seeing in principle is there's a complete and utter reformation occurring around organizational structure relative to working from home. You know, we, we talk about working from home and the challenges but there's a lot of CEOs in South Africa that are quite shocked at the fact that their productivity levels have actually gone up. They're actually doing more with their folks sitting at home. Now, there is the other side of the coin around people being challenged and you know, working from home has all the other challenges associated with it, but it is, is definitely forcing the executives out there to reimagine not just business structure, I think their businesses 
and, and what they're going to do from here on in. So it, it's, it's been a privilege being part of WeWork during this dispensation. And I love what you've just been saying because that's been our journey. We've been at Biz News, a company that was always remote, and we've now become uh, WeWork clients or, or, or uh, um, I don't know what you would call it, probably ambassadors or missionaries. We just love the fact of what you've created there, <laughs> Steph. And, right. and it really works for us. And we're really missing getting together and coming to a, a common space. But I guess we reimagined our business a long time before those who were sitting in big organizations and, uh, and uh, lots of office space and that had to. The, uh, Tony uh, Chinspana said that SAB Miller was at the core of world-class manufacturing back then. He was part of the team that did the implementation. So I just thought you might li like to hear that one. That's okay. Good, yeah. So, they were indeed. Uh, how, before we go, we go on to that, and I'd, I'd really like to just throw around uh, a few questions about radical change, but just to remind everyone that, as Stuart said earlier, you can post your questions uh, in the little box uh, that is that is on the screen there. Actually, Stuart, you want to just take us through that again? Uh, I see Carl Grillenberger, another CEO of a listed company, says he, he can't hear anything. I hope uh, he can hear now. Do you want to just uh, double check that with the hands up, Stuart? Thanks, Alec. Yes, um, I've just sorry on Carl. I sent him an option. I hope that works for him um, because it's it's individual. The just on the as you mentioned the questions, Alec. The control panel on the right hand side. There's a little drop down menu there. It's the questions bar. Just plop them in there, and we'll get to them as soon as possible. As you see, you've already spoken about shins there, Alec. So let's hope there's some more coming. Perfect. Okay, so radical change is of all we're hearing at the moment. We're also hearing that South Africa should stop the lockdown because we're well prepared. I had a, an amazing interview just before this with Professor Ian Flock from the Stellenbosch University, where it'll be up on our, our podcast tonight and, and, uh, and the full interview tomorrow. And here you have the head of neuroscience there saying, look, we're prepared as prepared as we're going to be, but we now need to get the economy going again. And it's almost like there's this this uh, wave of belief that staying in lockdown is going to do more damage or more harm than good. I'd love to hear the three of you, uh, your views on that. Tony, starting with you. Alec, it's, it's, it's a very difficult tension for um, anybody, for government uh, in this instance to manage. Because if the lockdown is lifted and it's lifted before there's some sort of basis uh, to justify that, the chances, according to all the experts who talk about this every day, the chances are phenomenal that the uh, virus is going to come swimming back and it's going to cause even more destruction. So that's the dilemma everybody's sitting with. At the same time, we're sitting with this problem that there are now so many people whose lives have been utterly shattered that one's got to do something about that. We, we are in a calamitous situation. And there are no easy answers. I think the mistake that is being made at the moment is that governments are not being clear about why they are doing what they're doing. And it's very difficult for you and me to understand them and to, and to buy into the, to the narrative. There's a group set up in the, in the UK, um, yeah, and you might look at their, their um, YouTube um, products, a, a group called SAGE, which is a scientific advisory group set up by Sir David King, who incidentally is a South African. He was Tony Blair's um, chief scientific advisor. And he's brought together a group of scientists with a view to collecting the most accurate possible data and putting it together in a story that is transparent and that is saleable. And it's interesting to watch these guys. They're all world-class academics. It's interesting to hear them uh, listing the many, many issues that have to be taken into account in managing this whole process. It's not a simple issue at all. So I wouldn't come down on one side or the other. I understand kind of both sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be a very difficult juggling act for the government in this country with our social problems uh, to orchestrate. Mm -hmm. Suzanne? 
Yeah, I actually, I concur very much with what Tony's saying. I think, I think, um, you know, these are these are times where where the the roadmap is not an obvious one, um, and and the you know the consequences of of um, the the epidemic um, um, being you know escalating and becoming really severe within the South African consequent um, um, context would be you know would be equally destructive so uh, what i do really appreciate is that um, um i think as as you as you said um Alec, people's lives are, are you know are very precarious and um and and our ability to to become active and and start um creating economic um, viability for so many of, of our businesses is, is is a is a real imperative um but i think the way in which we do it um does have to be very considered um and and so I, I think this the concept of these kind of five levels and being able to manage uh, manage the risk um, even at a kind of a, a, a more of a, a, a provincial level um, seems quite sensible to me. Um, but I think I, I do think we're going to we do need to start making those steps now um, in terms of of enabling people to to get back to work. That would be my view. Stafford, there's a question here for you from Kevin Shames, and maybe you can shape this in with your answer. He mm -hmm. says, do you see the result of COVID-19 as being net negative or net positive for WeWork? Okay, before I get to that, let's just, I mean, the WeWork question is probably the, the easy one. Let's get to the, the one just before. I think there is a definite fundamental raising of an argument that's happening. And I think, you know, when the lockdown mm -hmm. occurred, the first couple of weeks, people were kumbaya, then it got extended, and then people started going, wait a minute, okay, so what does this mean? Um, mm -hmm. Is this virus just going to go away in six months' time? I, I keep hearing and it, it, uh, us deliberating, and, and I think there's one element of this that we need to consider very seriously. That is, we don't have, and you know, we don't have a vaccine for this thing. We don't fully understand this thing. Symptoms are now starting to be unpacked. And uh, everyone right now is a virologist or an epidemiologist, right? Luckily for me, um, as a board member of the CSIR, I do get to see over the ledge at some of the, the, the best minds in this particular space that are advising the president. And where we're sitting right now, is it's quite precarious because as a leader, you're sitting with two bad options. One, especially if you're an African leader, because there's just no fundamental substrate from an economic perspective where you can triage your situation, where you can throw stimulus in to an extent that we see the United States doing or we say the UK doing. So you're sitting with two fundamental choices that are really bad choices. Either people die of the virus or people die from your economic steps that you've taken. So it's like, it's, it's, a, it's a starvation death or it is a, it's a viral death. And this is a very, very, very difficult and precarious dilemma that we sit in. I think it doesn't have to be the zero sum game. I don't think it's about open up the economy on keep it closed. I think things that are very simple, and I see it from a digital perspective, is things like e-commerce. You know, the fact that we're now having philosophical, political beliefs influencing stages and ratchets of the lockdown opening up, uh, those things could hurt us. I think we could do some things very quickly in the short term that doesn't necessarily mean we expose ourselves en masse and we stimulate this virus and we spread it, et cetera. I think we can do things like e-commerce, which we've been fighting for as an ICT uh, uh, sector that just open that up. You know, from an e-commerce perspective, you could stimulate businesses. You allow businesses to go digital and sell their wares. But if you don't transversely open that up, I think that that's short-sighted. And I think that's what we, the danger here, I don't think is, is lockdown, not lockdown. I don't think it's so much just the virus. I do think it's these philosophical, political beliefs that are underpinning some of the leanings and the thinking. And that's the danger. So we need to really watch out for that and kind of lobby against. And that's the stuff that worries me more. In terms of we work and uh, you know again let me just i'm going to take my we work hat and just put it on for a second we works managed to do a quite a, a, a substantial change in its business model very very rapidly not just because you know we had a new ceo that came on board just before you know the virus kind of went crazy but our space has changed and like i said during my opener we're seeing a lot of enterprise businesses approaching us now looking for space um, because working from home is possible. So we work space becomes very real, but what they want is hyper hygienic space. So people are asking us to implement a lot of the services that we've now done. So when you walk into a WeWork, it's very, very different. Alec, when your team goes back to 155 West, it's, you're gonna be shocked at the amount of augments and technologies um, that have been 
introduced into the building will be personified. I mean, you'll see it in the elevator. No, no more than four people can walk in there. When you're waiting for something, social distancing, demarcating stickers on tables, on floors, um, our HVAC systems, we've implemented more filtering tools and, and our building management system is now optimized for viral detection. Uh, so the argument is that WeWork space is probably the most hygienic, cleanly monitored space that you could find yourself in as a business to do business in. This has become a very attractive offering out in the marketplace today. Simply because people's own staff don't want to go back to their buildings. They're going, I'm not going back to that building. You know, I'm not going back to that place where I worked. Or I'm not going to catch two buses and a taxi to get to, you know, downtown Joburg and walk into that bank. I'm not going to do that. You know, I'm just scared. I, I, I've got an underlying condition. So what do you do? How do you service those people? Working from home is not sustainable. So WeWork's business offering right now is becoming, as, as has become extremely attractive. I've, I've never been on more calls with net new customers on a day-to-day -day basis over the last probably 14 days as I've done now. People that want to understand it. Also, businesses understand, and I think one of the things, Alec, you know, and, and you know, you're a small business in, in, you know, in terms of your size. If you take a look at the larger enterprise, you know, on their balance sheets, having a long-term lease is not a good thing. So what we're seeing is every business is rethinking long-term liabilities and assets associated with that. So there's a lot of businesses coming to us saying, hey, you know what? We're exiting these leases. We don't ever want long-term leases on our balance sheets moving forward. We want flex space. And that underlying value proposition of co-working is the ability to come in and trombone your human resource as you need it, your growth or your retraction in terms of, of just pure human count in your business. I mean, we allow that. We allow for that tromboning. And that's a massive value proposition right now. So, so it's not just we work. It's co-working and the ability to flex a lease is, is, uh, is, is critical right now because no business is going to sign a 15 to 20 to 25 year lease and, and put all the tenant installation optimizations in there. And people want to focus back on their business again you know, because they, they're stressed and they're strained. So uh, that's how we kind of seeing space moving within this context. And it's accelerated. I mean, I'm literally talking about 14 to 16 days worth of activity. I mean, it's just in absolutely incredible how that's just done a complete U-turn, which is great for um, us. Um, yeah. yeah, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to do a bit of speed dating now because we have got yeah. dozens of questions. <laughs> so I don't know how many of these we're going to get through, but I'm going to speed date them with you. Uh, Stuart Robinson asks, will the speed upgrade and cost reductions that we're seeing on broadband and bandwidth from internet service providers endure after lockdown? Anyone want to take, anyone want to pick that one up? Tony? Or maybe Stafford, it's your game, yeah, I suppose. Yeah, technology yeah. expert. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think what's happened now is, uh, you know, tech companies have realized that they've really got to focus on a few things. I think uh, from an enterprise perspective, it, that, the market has opened up for new, not a new, an incremental set of services associated with enabling enterprises work from home architecture. So you see, you know, large technology integrators suddenly being employed to help corporations build uh, a remote working technological architecture with the necessary tools and services. And, you know, some of them have gone very quickly and adopted that businesses and, and are now operating. But a lot of those, those large integrator companies are really focused on that and getting that going. I think, um, you know, where, where connectivity, the last mile providers, folks like Vodacom, uh, the folks that provide you either the wireless connectivity into your home or, you know, Vuma with your fiber terminating into your home, uh, they've done a great job. I, I mean, I've taken a look at quite a few ISPs over the last few weeks, especially in the beginning of lockdown where, I mean, I, I, I'm on Vuma and um, I, I know quite a few other ISPs have done this where if you were on a, a 50 megabits per second up and down line, they doubled it at no cost to you. It's not perpetual. But they just did that. And I think that was that was great. I mean, I saw my line go up to a 200 megabits per second line because I was on a 100 megabits per second line. And I've seen the difference, right? So it's a great thing because it, it but it's, it's sneaky because if you give someone, you know, 200 megabits per second, it's highly unlikely when you toggle them back down to 100 megabits per second that they're going to be happy staying there. So as much as there's a, a giving, I think it's a great marketing strategy. It's kind of a feed them this, let them get used to it because they're not going to ask for something less after this. I think that's that that's happening, but there's definitely a massive burden um, on them at the moment from a capacity planning perspective. Now, here's where the challenge comes in. Um, this what we have seen is is mass inequality suddenly in our faces. Right? It's always been there. It's not that it's it's never been there, but I think what we have seen is an acceleration 
of a of, of, of a revelation of how unequal we are the inequality in our in our in our in our in our populace the inequality in if you just forget this I and mean, if i just look around the amount of kids my kid is in second year varsity um, and I won't say which varsity, it's a private university, Bethany, she's 19 years old. Her classes still haven't taken off. Why? Because 80 something percent of the kids in that year, that second year, cannot afford the connectivity required or don't have access because it's simply not there. And these kids can't work. They, you know, they can't just get onto Zoom and Teams and, and all these things that my kids are able to do. And, 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 and that's, you know, that's where the last mile providers are being leaned on to open. And I think government has stepped forward, opened up spectrum. So now you see Vodacom launching 5G. You see, you know, more, more space opening up for them to, to do more. I don't think there's a lack of wanting to do. I think these folks are doing it. And I think they're doing a great job of it. The problem is just that the need, the demand out there is so massive because of the inequality. I mean, and it's so apparent in our faces right now. And that's the sadness of all of this, right? And that's why you see yeah. townships that where people think, you know, coronavirus is for is for white rich people. It's not for us down here in El Dorado Park or in Soweto because they're not getting the information that you and I are reading on a daily basis. They're not on these webinars that we listen to all the time. They they clock they locked off. They listen to you know an FM radio and that's about it. So so this has definitely shown us, you know, how wide wide this trench is between the haves and the have-nots in our country. Indeed. Uh, quite an interesting point there was the, I had a chat yesterday with Stavros Nikolaou, and this is a, a good idea for companies who are wanting to make a difference. What they uh, have done at Aspen is they've identified exactly the point that you are saying. The medical students at University of Pretoria do not all have access to technology. To A lot of them are there on scholarships. They don't have uh, iPads. So they bought 600 of these and they've been allocated to students so that those students can then continue to learn so that you don't have to wipe out a whole year and then put yeah. a whole year's intake behind. So very, very smart uh, insights there and, and well done to Aspen and other companies who are looking to do similar stuff. There's a, they, they really, I really must uh, hope that our second half will be, half hour will be on speed dating because there's an incredible amount of questions and we'd like to get through as many as we can. Alan Timors Hazen says, would someone please comment on the merits of our president taking a very statesmanlike lead by doing a daily report to the nation live on primetime TV? Tony? Well, I think it's a, 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 an absolutely essential idea, not just a good idea. But the problem is that there's now a believability crisis because there's been this bouncing around, there have been politicians getting involved and so forth, contradictions and unclarity about uh, some of the rules. And people now are becoming increasingly skeptical about the whole process. So that's a barrier he's got to be able to overcome. And the message has to be cleaned up inside before it can be communicated outside. And that is a real problem. But I think in, in, uh, in theory, it's an absolutely essential um, idea, and I think it, it's he, he clearly scored big points at the outset. But the trouble is, the points have been whittled away. As Stafford has said, people are getting you know tired of the whole process. They want to see some relief, and then they get these mixed messages, which absolutely bewilder and irritate them. Uh, there's a question from Tony Crades who wants to know the name again of the UK group of scientists doing YouTube presentations, Tony. It's the SAGE group. If you just uh, Googled um, um, Sir David King, you would get to it. You would find his initial uh, launch press statement about it, what it's there to do. And you'd then find the first of the meetings that they have had. And the intention is to to operate from outside of government and to provide a dispassionate, very cold-eyed view of what the uh, the COVID uh, story is all about. And these all, David is a is a professor at uh, at Cambridge. He's a highly respected international figure in the climate uh, debate, and uh, it's a very very powerful message. But it's also very worrying to hear the the lack of information that exists about this thing and its potential course. 
Beverly Steenkamp asked mm -hmm. for us to post the uh, the links too. I'm sure you can do that uh, if you don't mind. Let's uh, there, there's a there's a quite a uh, caustic comment here from Michael Lilliland who says you're all sitting on the fence. Uh, that is not leadership. I am 62. I shrugged off the virus in a week and I'm now vegetating in my home whilst my business collapses around me. Surely you quarantine the sick, the healthy, Suzanne? I, I, I fully appreciate that view. I, I do think the, 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 you know, the, 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 the epidemiology um, information that we have around uh, the risks to South Africa um, with, with our kind of uh, immune um, deficient population um, with with challenges like TB, um, I, I don't think we can be I don't think we can be entirely naive around what the potential impact of of, of COVID nineteen could be on South Africa and and therefore on on our economy. So so I, I do I do appreciate that potentially what um, I you know I am sounding like I'm sitting on the fence, but I don't think this is I don't think this is just a, a, a very straightforward um answer i'm i'm not in favor of, of an environment where we where we are not cognitive of the health risks to our population so so but but having said all of that um i fully fully appreciate that um that people do need to be able to make a living and that's why um that is why i do think we need to be finding these low contact um, opportunities in our in our environment and in our society to um, you know to start to start stimulating stimulating our economy and our activity. Um, I know I mean there was a recent article now in the Economist that talked about the 90% economy. Um, what it was saying was really that the you know that that post COVID-19 there, there are probably 10% of 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 current um, economic activity that just wouldn't be viable in a social distance environment. Um, but it it really underscored a lot of what Stafford was saying is that that to a large extent a post-COVID environment um, does entrench and deepen some of the inequalities in society because it because it fundamentally it's it's your low skill people and your kind of manual um, working spaces that are most severely impacted um, by a social distancing requirement. Um, and so I think in the South African context, us finding these responsible and, 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 and sensible ways of getting our economy working and understanding how we can implement um, social distancing and, and, and just, you know, sensible um, um, ways of, of getting people working but keeping, keeping our society okay. safe is, is just, it, it's just a, a fine line and, a, and an important task. Yeah, Alex, can I add on to that? I, I just want to, I just want to say something that, 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 that adds to Sorry. it. So yeah, quickly, yeah, he's sure. by saying, oh, sorry, I'm in the UK. Oh. <laughs> Mike. Uh, okay, Michael, All right, you had a good answer there. <laughs> Stafford, follow up and then also tell us what will happen, because Enrico Knussen wants to know, if the internet crashes. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, I'll, I'll I'll do that in a second. I'll do that in a second. So so I think that let's not sit on the fence. I think what's very very clear is the following. I think that what the government is doing right now in South Africa, what they did was great. What they're doing forward requires more creativity. It requires more input. It requires more nuance. It, it requires a higher grade of skill set and a more diverse allocation and and you know a coming together of a collective to give them input. And I think that's we now quickly need that competency. I think you, we, we, they are doing it wrong at the moment. What they have done has been amazing. And, but I, I don't agree with a complete opening of the economy and just let's just go. I don't agree with that. I, I don't think it's necessary. I think there's clear steps that we can take very rapidly. Now, I, just coming back, I, yesterday I spoke to Adrian Saville. You know, he's a professor at uh, Gibbs University and you know, very great economic mind. And, you know, one of the things that is so missing at the moment is exactly that. It's communication. It's coming out on a daily basis or, you know, it would be amazing. Thursday nights at eight o'clock on the dot on time. We know our president's going to be on television and he's going to spend an hour with us telling us what happened the previous seven days. What is the framework around his thinking? What's the strategy? Um, and maybe not the details, but at least the principles of the thinking. I think that's the leadership that we need right now. And leadership is not about just taking action and standing back. I think leadership is more participative now. Um, you know, we live in a world where organizational, you know, sustainability is, is, is a co-creation. It's not a collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, people want to be part of it. They want to be thinking with you. 
And I think what, what Cyril Ramaphosa needs to do, our president needs to do, is open up the communication channels, show behind the curtain what is the framework of the thinking, what is the premise, what is the model, what is, what's the strategy that they're following. I think if we can have more verbosity there on a timeless, consistent, predictable basis, I think his leadership take, takes him to the next level. I take a look, Governor Cuomo in, in New York, uh, you see him almost every day on CNN at around five o'clock, six o'clock our time, right? He's sitting up there and he spends half an hour to 45 minutes telling us what happened before, what's happening right now, where this is going, being very open, very transparent. That's the leadership we need right now. I feel that we've been, South Africa's lacked leadership so badly over the last 10 to 15 years specifically, that when a president gets up and articulates things somewhat and takes action, we are all mesmerized by it and we're happy with it. But now we need another discipline, another, uh, an, another level of leadership. And that leadership is, is, is required right now. And I, I've said it over and over, and I actually tagged it in my Twitter profile some time ago. What we need, what the world needs more right now is not a vaccine. It needs true, proper leadership, human-led leadership. I, you know, that's what I believe the planet needs, South Africa needs at the moment. And, that, and I think what we have a problem with right now is not a virus problem. I think that may be the underlying substrate of the issue. I think the, the thing that's stopping us and, 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 and making us trip on a global basis is this complete lack of leadership. I think leadership is such, it's the headline for all of what's happening right now. Um, can the internet cope with this? Very good question. I think, yes, absolutely. I think um, if you take a look at where the, the internet's architected, if you take a look at what some of the cloud providers are doing, um, yes, absolutely. I think the guys know exactly how to scale. I mean, if you take a look at Google, when I worked there, they were handling um, this may be some internal information that I'm still embargoed to say, but I'll say this. Um, I, I remember there used to be a, a QPS score. Um, the, and when I was there, the highest QPS was, was uh, 8 billion. And that was 8 billion queries per second. They must be wow. way beyond that right now. I think they're probably in the 100 billion queries per second. You know? So you know, that's just activity rate. Yes, absolutely, we can scale. That's not the issue. I think the issue is the commercial models underlying the last mile connectivity you know can we that's kind of where you have this big fat cloud in the sky with all the scaling capacity and an infinite uh, accommodation of anything that you want to execute but the problem is you've got this thin pipe running into it and how can we scale that pipe out um, so you can have a better experience that is not a technological issue that is a you know that's an ICASA issue you know ICASA is important because ICASA has to release the necessary spectrum so folks that are in the telco sector can release the bandwidth that you require on the very edge. Government needs to do that quickly, rapidly. You know, now this, with this pandemic, that's probably the most important thing that needs to happen from a technological perspective right now. It's just open that up. They've done it, but they need to completely open up that spectrum and allow these last, last mile providers to actually give us the internet that we deserve. And because it's a human right, it's not just a privilege. And it's, it's unfortunate that, you know, it is the situation where we find ourselves again, leadership. If we have leadership, um, you know, these things get overcome and we execute against them a lot more rapidly. Sorry for being a little bit... Um, I thought yeah. you were going to say it was unfortunate that uh, Stella went for lunch to her pals and then got it on to Twitter. Because uh, <laughs> the person who should be opening up the bandwidth has been suspended. <laughs> but anyway... We all, uh, we, all, we all have to eat, Alec. We all have to eat. Right? We all have to eat, of course. <laughs> uh, Alan, uh, so Boris and just, uh, just to your point there, says that uh, talking about Cyril coming on and speaking regularly to the nation, he says he'll obviously won't have clear answers every day, but it's an yeah. opportunity to build trust, confidence, communication, transparency, and a positive That's momentum fine. for the nation. So, come on, uh, yeah. Cyril, need you. Yep. Uh, on to the next question here from Caroline Henderson. Scientists are dominating government decision making at present. Scientists are notoriously uncomfortable with dealing with uncertainty and will keep asking for more information. Is their dominance appropriate in the context of the huge economic consequences of this radical strategy for dealing with an uncertain disease? Tony? I think it absolutely is because the alternative is you have politicians making political decisions based on what? And the chances of them getting it wrong are colossal. Look at the clown show we see in the United States every night where we have somebody standing up and guessing and telling untruths and all the rest of it. It's ridiculous. And the scientists do not get their voices properly heard. And that's precisely what the, the SAGE group in, in the UK is trying to deal with. They, they are concerned about policymakers 
sitting in what should be scientific discussions and scientific decision-making processes. So absolutely. But again, there's a balance. You have a very restive population here, which is getting more restive by the, by the second. And that has to be managed. And that's the job of the politicians. So they need to speak with one voice. They need to speak on the basis of evidence and facts. And they need to be absolutely consistent about what they're saying. What they need to provide us at the moment as a matter of extreme urgency, I think, is a way forward. How long exactly are these phases going to last or this next one? And what might be the next steps out of it? At the moment, all of us are guessing at it. And the guessing is very toxic. So there's no doubt about the need for the science to be predominant. When you look at Professor Karim here talking about the science of the situation in South Africa, he's got amazing credibility, huge credibility. Mm. And that credibility needs to be tapped into and built upon. And Suzanne, it sounds Maybe, to me um, like... Alex, So, sorry, I wanted to just add to, add to what Tony's saying. You know, I think I think we are all wanting clarity in terms of of, of something more concrete in terms of how to think about and plan and uh, you know in our personal lives, but from a business perspective particularly as well, and just how how, how things are going to pan out. But I do I do also believe that. And, and maybe just to reinforce this idea of, of, of regular and weak, um, um, regular communication and, and transparency around what the parameters are that are being used to make key decisions. Um, because, because the reality is I think we, we also all understand that, that it, is, it is not one of these situations where one can have a crystal ball and understand exactly what, how things are going to transpire over time, um, you know, we we still, uh, you know, the, the the scientists are still learning a huge amount about how this disease works. We're learning about uh, the impact. Um, um, Stafford earlier referred to, you know, the, the 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 way the epidemic will react within an African context. There's just so many things that actually, with with um, with all the best um, scientific data and all the best knowledge that we can gather, there will still be elements which are not you know not fully predictable and mm. i think as 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 business people in a society we would be tolerant and understanding of an environment where our leaders take us into their confidence they explain the way that they're making the decisions what the parameters are what are the criteria they're using um and under which circumstances what kind of actions can we expect um and then then if we do have to be in a situation where on a you know a, a, a more regular iterative um um, cycle. There are adjustments adjustments made to to plans. We we would I think I think we would be very understanding of that as people, um, and appreciative of it. But 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 the but the 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 moment I think what is frustrating people is the sense that we don't know how to judge when what steps would be taken and and what those could look like. But you know what, Susanna? I think what we need, what what we need, Alec, was we need I you know I, we need to be careful. Because yes, we don't want political leanings to, to, to lean too much into the political realm. Yeah? And we see what that happened. But we need to be careful that we don't lean too much into the scientific realm either. You know, when you take a look at the folks, the, the, you know, just before COVID-19, the world was upside down because of people that were, you know, scientists and computer scientists, etc. Mark Zuckerberg. And, you know, these folks I think in a very linear way. They think in a very specific way. And let's be honest, Fauci in the United States has been wrong many times. January, February, he said many things that are incorrect. I think what we need in the room is diversity. I think what we need in the room are our anthropologists. I think we need historians more so than we've ever needed them before. You know, thought leaders that can cross-pollinate into the, into the narrative, into the diaspora, because we have been here before. You know, world wars have brought us here before. We've had plagues before. And I think there are things that where people need to just put up the rear view mirrors to show us how we reacted, to show us in principle what lays ahead. Because, yes, it may not repeat it, but it definitely rhymes where we are right now. And where, where the, the people that I find um, when I speak to them on a one-on-one -on -one basis are the folks that are more anthropological, you know, folks that are more paleontological, the folks that are more historian-based folks versus the scientists or the politicians, et cetera. And I think these people need to be in the room. And I think if we can give those people platforms to cross-pollinate, 
I think the diversity there will give us strength in terms of our strategy, in terms of our thinking, and in terms of what lays ahead. We just, you know, that's what human beings want right now. They want transparency with, a, with, with some level of certainty. And when that doesn't exist, then, you know, you do have this dystopia that starts emerging where people take the law into their own hands and we see shootings where people are complaining about cigarettes and then they're complaining about alcohol and et cetera, et cetera. And I think these are just symptomatic of that underlying need that we as humanity need. We need, we need those basic principles. And again, leadership. Karen Koch asks, she says, uh, or it's a bit of a comment, but it also is, is aimed at you, Stafford. She says, we were told lockdown was necessary to enable the health system to have time to prepare. Have they really not prepared yet after six weeks? The virus is not raging out of control as it did in Italy and Spain. And many of the draconian rules are not clearly linked to what we're trying to achieve. Are we just going to stay in lockdown for a year until we have a vaccine? I refer to the Panda report showing the deaths from lockdown will far exceed virus deaths. Also, Gareth Cliff and Mike Abel's letters, which were on Biz News and still is our top story, by the way. We're heading for disaster if we don't start opening up. And with respect, what Stafford is talking about is not relevant to the vast majority of people in the informal sector in this country. I think spot on. I think uh, absolutely. Just the, the beginning of that question, Alec, was actually the question that I wanted, the rub of that question. Just can you repeat the very beginning bit of that question? We were told lockdown was necessary to enable the health system time to prepare. Have they yeah, yeah. not prepared yet after six weeks? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the rub of that question. Um, I think you're absolutely right in terms of broadly speaking, what I'm positing uh, is may not be completely applicable to a very large populace um, within our society in South Africa. I think you're absolutely right. Um, but, you know, I don't even know how to comment on that. I come from there, right? I grew up there, El Dorado Park, you know, Deep Kloof. Um, you know, the, the, the possibility of this being uh, a, bon, a bonfire, the possibility of this being a tinderbox is very, very real. Because, you know, when, when the fire gets lit there, it's, it's, it's stupendous what could potentially happen from an overwhelming perspective relative to our healthcare system. Um, as our healthcare system ready, look, uh, just from the fringes of me seeing in from a CSIR perspective, I think readiness is... Again, what I'm about to articulate to you, I wish that our leadership would do this. And this is what those, you know, systematic calls would do. They'd share where the progress that we're making. Example, what's happened at the CSIR is incredible. It's not just that big command center that's been set up with um, trace and track capability where, I mean, it's a leading, it's the World Health Organization saw that as a world first in terms of innovation. Um, and it's, uh, the, from a technological perspective, it's quite profound, but that's not the only thing. You know, we, we, there's substances that the CSIR scientists are working on now, right now where the, sub, the, the, the covering, you spray on your, your PPE, so all over it, and the virus just cannot attach to it and actually dies on it quicker than it would die on a copper surface. They're working on that right now. That's going to be a world first. We, there are, there's different things around detection, etc. We are doing amazing things in this country, and we're just not hearing it. Now, um, in terms of readiness and what's happened, readiness is, is, a, is a very complex, um, multidimensional challenge. It's not just we bought a bunch of stuff and then we put it in. Are we 100% ready right now? Not yet. Um, we're still buying PPP, uh, PPEs. I mean, I, I, there's a lot of procurement happening, I know. Um, there's a lot of fields that are being repurposed. We've heard of ice rinks that could be potential uh, places where, from, from a morgue perspective, to put bodies. So there's still a lot of planning and thinking. And I just wish that the maturity rating of that could be communicated to us in a very clear way. I don't know where we are at. I don't think we, we're there yet. It's only, I mean, it's, it's been, what, six weeks? Um, you know, to mobilize relative to the forecast of where we could be in September uh, from a mortality rate and an infection rate, um, we're not there yet. That's what I'm hearing from, you know, internal government annals. That's not what I know definitively, is that we're still in the process of preparation. We're not complete yet. Yes, we're very positive, much better than we've been before, but this is still a work in progress. It really, really is. Um, and they're doing some great work, both on procurement, physical establishment of structures to, to house bodies and human beings, um, all the way through to new inventions. Uh, from a trace track perspective through, you know, surface, surface disinfectants. So it's a kaleidoscope of, of challenges that's being faced and, and, and which the government is doing a very good job of, but they're just not communicating. But no, it's not done. We're not there. Um, that's what I'm picking up right now. 
Tony, uh, Barry Harmonha wants to know, the lockdown has effectively removed the working capital of many small businesses, but the capital assets are still intact. How can these businesses be resuscitated? <laughs> the simple answer is with great difficulty. Um, somehow they've got to tap cash. They need cash to operate, and if the banks or other funders are not prepared to come in behind them and help them realize some of the cash that might exist in those assets, they'll have a problem. And that's going to be the sticking point for many, many businesses as we move ahead, is they simply can't afford to open the doors tomorrow morning. They've got a nice whatever, you know, computer or, or um, some machinery or office furniture or something, but can't afford to open the doors. So it's going to be a very, very tough time. We, the, the economy is in an absolutely dire position at the moment. And we need to obviously get out of it as quickly as we possibly can. And all these things we've talked about, I think, are at the nub of it. Is government being crystal clear or as clear as it can be about how this process is going to unfold? And bear, bear in mind that the consequences of being precipitous about it are absolutely awful. Peter Parpenfuss asks, uh, and I'd like, we're coming pretty close to the end of our program now, uh, a minute each says the president will address the nation at half past eight tonight on measures to support accelerating downscaling of lockdowns and reopening the economy. What are you hoping the president will say? Shall we start with you, Suzanne? Um, yeah, Alex, so, so I mean, I, I, I am hoping that what we will see is um, is, is clarity, as I said earlier, of, of just how, how the measures are going to be um, uh, put put in place for us to understand um, at which levels um, we are able to operate at what um, you know at what capacity within within the economy. So, so um, I think clarity around how we're measuring these things and what those guidelines are, um, and and the ability for us to have more people um, active and working working within a safe context. Stefan. Uh, I think I, my, my hope and, and, and my prayer is that he, um, you know, from a, I'll, put, I'll speak it from an ICT perspective. I think there is a lot that can happen um, from a digital perspective to unlock businesses and allow businesses to operate. I think the e-commerce thing is a major, major, major thing. If you take a look at every economy in the world and every circumstance we find, you know, in the UK, in the United States, home deliveries, the ability to, to get things online, is both an opportunity to, you know, once it's there, once the gate opens up for that to occur, it will actually allow innovation by small businesses, et cetera, in this particular space. I'm finding a lack of innovation. I think people are just waiting to see things unlock and then it's business as usual. I think everyone on this, on this webinar and everyone that listens to this needs to realize it's not business as usual. You know, you, if you own a particular business and, and it operates in a particular way and the hope that government's going to open up completely so you can operate like you did just a couple of weeks ago, forget that. It, you've got to reimagine your business. You've got to reimagine how you did, how you gained access to customers, how you generated demand. And, and, and right now it feels like it's hyper digitization that gets you there because everyone is connected. Everyone is on mobile. Everyone does have connectivity, broadly speaking. So I'm praying that the president will open up the digital channels for businesses to have a place where they can reimagine themselves and go and execute that reimagination um, and, and a re and a re-strategization. Right now, that doesn't exist. And I think that's what's necessary at the moment. I'm praying that he opens up that layer because I think that layer is very transversal. It's not a technological story. You know, if you're a manufacturer, technology is important. If you're a, a business that does any particular thing, the technology access to people gain, generating demand and awareness right now is a technological story. Please, Mr. President, open up those channels because that's low human contact. That's a complete, um, a, you know, a contactless way of attaining things, et cetera. And I think I, if he opens that up, I think that could be a big step in the right direction. Um, but let's see. We know what to watch for then uh, from uh, to see whether the Mossy House is celebrating or not tonight. <laughs> What's from your side, Tony? Uh, for one minute on what uh, you hope you know, is. Uh, Jack Welsh was famous for saying when he was the chairman of General Electric, you have to look the future in the eye and see the reality that exists, not the one that you'd like to see. Mm -hmm. And on the one hand, we need a clear picture of where we sit now the uh, processes that have taken place, the facilities that have been put in place, and there are lots of them, 
some of the initiatives that are taking place, uh, what has happened to the various funding activities, etc. But on the other hand, Napoleon said, a leader is a dealer in hope. And Cyril has to give the country hope. The fact is there is a future. There is a future for this country. We've got 50 plus pe uh, million people in this country who want to create a future. And he needs to give them a sense of what the roadmap might be. Will he be able to give them all of the detail? Of course not. But at least he can say, guys, there's a path forward here. Let's talk about how we're going to make it happen. We're going to take these three steps in the next while, and then we will recalibrate because we can't see beyond that. And then we'll take another three steps, but we are going towards a better future for all of us. That is the intention. And the, the language that has been allow, allowed to, to creep into the uh, debate so far about which businesses, white businesses or black businesses might get uh, funding or support, etc. I think he's got to whack that right on the head so that people understand we are all in this canoe and we'd better all row it in the same direction fast if we want to get through this calamity. And we will get through it. Human beings are extremely innovative. If you look at the innovations that have happened around the world in recent months, where you get a James Dyson creating a, a ventilator in 10 days, when you get the Formula One Mercedes team coming to the party and making these things, when you see a GE or, or General Motors or Ford com uh, company making ventilators and producing masks and Louis Vuitton producing masks, the, the concerted effort that is being made at the moment is absolutely astonishing and it will have massive benefits for all of us on the on the planet. So I think that it's too easy at the moment to lapse into complete despair about what's going on. And what we need to focus on is the prize. What is it that we're striving to be as we go forward? And let, that's what he needs to be able to, to articulate for us. And again, it, it comes back to this issue of leadership. That's what leaders do. They say, this is the whole, this is how we're getting out. Well, we are hoping, and there are many people who've actually put that up onto our questions as well, uh, uh, talking about the president addressing the nation at half past eight tonight, and specifically on measures to support accelerated downscaling of lockdowns and reopening the economy. Uh, Stafford, Mark Hankinson, who's uh, one of our leading business in South Africa, says, well done. <laughs> I don't know if you thought that you actually whispered in Cyril's ears, but either way, we, we're coming to the end of the conversation today, but I'd like to finish uh, with a, a question here from Hush Naidu. And Hush says, I'm a photographer and I understand that we cannot open the economy, but where do we fit in to be able to make a living? And Hush will be one of many, many trades and many uh, professions who are thinking the same way around. So let's close, or if you could direct your closing comments to that question and just giving us your perspectives. Ladies first. Um, Alec, I think, um, you know, we had a conversation just with, with my team earlier this week and, and our conclusion was, um, and I think it echoes to a large extent what both Stafford and Tony were, were saying now, uh, our perspective is that we have to all think um, in, in kind of startup mode. Um, you know, when, 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 when we started our business, we, we were a group of people who sat around a dining table and we literally questioned everything from first principle level. Um, nothing was off the table in terms of what could be reimagined, rethought, and 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 uh, you know finding new ways of of, of approaching um, approaching things. And and I think the critical thing at this point is for us all to um, in in our various roles, in our various jobs, in our various areas, in in the skills that we have, is to is to really rethink. Um, our, our opportunities and to be as creative um, as, as we can be in terms of how we how we reimagine how we can do things and where our skills can be applied in new in new ways um, and 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 inevitably if you if you uh, let go of the way things were and 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 are able to kind of uh, question as I say in that kind of startup mentality um, then 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 there are often uh, concepts that that you can unlock that you may not have recognized previously because you kind of you know we all get we all get uh, stuck in our routines and then the second thing I would say is I think just start doing stuff um, 
I think it's very easy to get paralyzed. And I think one of the critical things that, that everyone can do, leaders um, and, and all of us in our, in our various roles, is actually start doing things, just experiment. Um, we're in an environment now where um, the opportunity is there to try new things and everybody's expecting us to do that. Um, and if something doesn't work, it doesn't matter. Then you've learned something and you, and you try the next new thing. But I think we should start actually engaging in activity as opposed to being um, um, paralyzed by, by the enormity of, of what we face. Thank you, Suzanne. Stafford, your final comments? I, I think the principle of the question asked is a, is, a, is a key thing. I think Suzanne did a brilliant job of, 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 of addressing that. I think I want to take it to, to in, in principle, to the broader enterprise leaders out there. Um, you know, what, what worries me about where we are, more so than anything else um, from a technological perspective, is artificial intelligence. Um, because artificial intelligence is a superpower. You know, it's very real. I see it operate. And uh, artificial intelligence's superpower requires character today. Because I think organizations in this dispensation, with this crisis around us, you know, leaders could employ these superpowers to ultimately give us our dystopian outcome in an accelerated manner. I always say AI is a superpower, but it's, you know, it's, it's kryptonite is inequality as a consequence. And I think that's what we've got to watch out for. And what I worry about right now and what I'm trying to do a lot of is do one-on-ones with uh, CEOs in South Africa and some in the United States, one-on-ones where we're just sitting down and talking about the philosophy of utilizing technological tools not to do what you did before in an automated fashion with less human beings mm -hmm. because what a lot of businesses are thinking about right now is how do i just drop my 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 operating costs right and my business has got you know the demand has sunk the the fundamentals from a commercial perspective for my business is completely you know toppled and you know how can i use these technological tools to do more of what i did before in a more automated way. And that's a dystopia that we need to watch out for. What we need to do is do what was previously unimaginable with the tools and the people that we have today. AI is a human machine symbiosis story. And in a time of crisis, it's not laying off your workforce. It's not just getting rid of them. It's actually going back in a room and realizing that if human beings are augmented with these technology, technological assets, they can do, they can imagine Bookstores can become large cloud providers, right? Uh, people that ship DVDs tomorrow can become content producers. Um, we need to think about the principles of the technological forces in our hands as leaders of large enterprise customers where we can create businesses that are co-creative. So three principles here. Don't build products and systems and services only anymore. Build ecosystems. And those ecosystems are underlined by you know, a couple of laws. Number one, if you're a business, make everything that you make hackable, extensible, accessible. So the photographer out there can have some value from a co-creative perspective within your organization. You know, so, so, so make yourself hackable and extensible as an enterprise, today more so than ever before. The second thing is ask yourself as a business, are you deriving less value than you create? The, the, the notion of being an extractive business doesn't have sustainability moving forward. We need to think about that. Are we deriving less value than we're creating as a business? And if we are, then you've got sustainability in this new dispensation. Last one, everything that you do and every bit of your strategy needs to be based on humanity, not technology. As much as it is about technology today, it's more so about humanity. And that humanity requires empathy. That humanity needs a, a fundamental understanding of hum humans. And as leaders, those three things are so important right now because we can use technological tools today to have dystopian outcomes because we are in an accelerated environment today. So don't think about laying off people. Don't think about doing more with less to increase your operating margin because your business is shrinking. Think about utilizing those assets to do things that were previously thought impossible because you can. And if we land up with businesses that have disintermediated humanity, if we land up, it won't be because of the technological tools, it will be because of a lack of imagination on behalf of leadership. And I encourage people to just go back indoors and rethink, make it a human story, don't make it a technological story. Tony? You know, if I just get back to the, the photographer and his problem, there's a, there's a foundational issue which he sits with and which, which every business sits with. And that is that there are basically three questions in strategy you need to deal with. 
who is our customer and who, who will it be in the future? Who would we like it to be? What value are we going to offer to that customer and how might we do it? And on the basis of those three questions, a brainstorm about what you can do about them is often very, very profitable. We look too often, I think, for blue sky, massive, out of the box type thinking in a business when it's that's not the problem. The problem is the basics. I've seen this uh, up close with many, many businesses from the time that the, the uh, great financial crash started when CEOs would call me and they'd say, come and talk about my strategy. Well, what do you want? Well, we need some more, you know, out of the box stuff. We need uh, innovation. We need a radical shift here, etc. But when I went and talked to their customers and to their people, that turned out not to be the problem. The problem was that they were simply not doing what they were telling their potential customers they would do. I've had experiences in the last 10 days or so talking to a number of businesses, very prominent, prominent companies, where the service has been absolutely appalling, not because they can't do it, but because somebody hasn't focused on getting the basics right. And there's not an obsession with the basics. And my sense is, and that's what I wrote about in these, these books of mine, and particularly the last lot, businesses become over, some, uh, over complex. We have complexified it to the extent that we can't actually do it. And getting back to the basics has to be a first step for most businesses to answer those simple questions and then as Suzanne said not to keep on pontificating but to go out there put your foot in the water and see what happens and then put another foot in the water and see what happens for years mm -hmm. I've advocated to companies that they plan in 30-day cycles and many say well that's lunacy it's much too quick you know what about the long term you will get to the long term but you won't get there if you don't take a, a step in the short term. So these basic things, I think, need to be attended to as a matter of urgency in most businesses, not just in the photographer's business. That's where we are falling down. You look at customer service around town when you go into shops and you ask for a black T-shirt and they say, yeah, we've got white ones. Or you ask for a size eight shoe and they say, I haven't got that, but I've got a size five and a half. Why does that nonsense perpetuate? It perpetuates because the managers are not obsessive about the, the, the small details in their businesses. So I love the idea of big dreams and, you know, flying to the moon and all that sort of stuff. It's terrific. But first, you've got to pump the tires and fill the tank with gas because otherwise you go nowhere. Tony, uh, Hush has actually come back and said, Amen, what insights from all three panelists. And wow, so true. There are just too many questions. I do apologize that we haven't been able to get around to even half of them. Uh, the um, comments now are coming through is thank you very, very much for this uh, presentation today. It was most appreciated by pretty much everybody. Uh, well, everybody who's commented anyway. Uh, it's our record number of attendees ever at a Biz News webinar and so just as well we actually increased our capacity so everyone could get in this week uh, just just from my side to the three of you thank you so much for giving up your time and and for sharing your wisdom with us uh, and and for giving us those insights and really to close off from my side just two two things um, i've just finished reading uh Euro of noah harari's latest book uh of 25 i think it's 21 questions for, for the 21st century and in there, he talks at great length about one of the points that was made continuously through this webinar, and that is that the big threat to humanity is irrelevance. If you happen to be on the wrong side of the divide, you will become or you could become irrelevant and we could have masses of people who fall into that category. And that would be uh, talking. We all need to take responsibility in some way of be ensuring that we don't become irrelevant. Uh, and the second point and just to close off with something that Suzanne said in 2006, I was privileged to be at uh, in Monaco. I think anybody who goes to Monaco is very privileged, but it was to cover the World Entrepreneur of the Year event that Ernst & Young sponsors. And they get the best entrepreneurs from all over the world and they put them in a room and that year, uh, the American uh, contingent, well, the American winner 
was the guy who started Whole Foods, for instance, and there were many other of that capacity. And the winner that year was Bill Lynch from South Africa who started Imperial. And I'll never forget that his one thing that stays with me, the late Bill Lynch, was he said, just do it. Uh, many people talk about things, they, they uh, have great ideas, but he said, just do it, just start it, just give it a go. And after you give it a go, who knows what could come from it. And that perhaps uh, is, is the final comment then to Hush Naidu and everybody else who's looking to reinvent, reimagine themselves in this new future. Just give it a go, just do it. And who knows where you might be in the future. In, at Biz News, final little personal thing. When I started Biz News in uh, August 2013, my dream was that we would get to 50,000 people a month would come to us. This past month, we got mm -hmm. to a million. And it just shows you that sometimes those dreams just uh, get blown out the water when you keep just doing it. So thank you again, everybody, for, for, uh, for being on this webinar, uh, for making it a record webinar, making it a, a record interesting webinar. And uh, we will, uh, Stuart will tell us in a moment, uh, be able to access it uh, for posterity. Stu? Thanks, Alec. Yes, I put the business YouTube channel there, Alec. We'll put the webinar up on that channel. It's there's a link there on the chat for all who would like to access it, and obviously for those who weren't here. So we'll do that as soon as we can after the webinar, and then we'll put it on the website as well with a little summation of everything that was discussed, which probably won't be so short because it was really fantastic insight. So thanks to all three of you and yourself, Alec, as always. So that's it from our side. Till the next time, cheerio. <laughs> Thank you.